We are so closely related to the chimpanzees that if you look at our DNA and their DNA, there's only about 1.6% difference. But look at a chimpanzee and look at us, and you can see quite a bit of difference. Now, why is this important? If you want to test medicines, if you want to test drugs, if you want to test vaccines, then you can use a chimpanzee, and they should react pretty much like a human would. So, if I had to choose between them experimenting on my grandchildren or a chimpanzee, I'd rather them use a chimpanzee. But if there's any way that they can test drugs and things without harming animals, of course, that would even be better. So what they do is usually, the, instead of starting out with monkeys and testing on them, they start out with rats and mice because they breed quickly, they don't cost very much, and people don't get as excited about killing uh, mice and rats as they do hurting chimpanzees. Before we go on, I wanted to show you a cartoon that I found that I feel strongly about. Uh, Einstein said, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. So each, when I talk about uh, genes, and I talk about evolution, and I talk about which genes are better than other genes, it depends on whether or not it helps you uh, adapt to your environment. So I wanted to clarify that point because the monkey can climb the tree, the bird can fly, the elephant can actually pick things up with its uh, trunk, the penguin has the ability to live in the ice, so every genetic composition allows different organisms to fit into different environments, to different niches. So don't think that because you're not as strong as the next person or you're not as smart as the next person that you aren't extremely intelligent and worthwhile. So I just wanted to point that out before we went on. Some of the things that the primates have evolved to be able to do, we have color vision. Our brain is larger than most other animals. Our eyes allow us to see stereoscopic vision, which means you can see things in 3D. So if you look with just one eye, you don't have any depth perception. But when you open that second eye, now you can tell whether you're going down into a hole or up over a hill. But with one eye, a lot of times it's hard to tell if you're looking down in a crater or if you're looking up at a, at a little mound. We have opposable thumbs, which means we can take our thumb and cross it across our palm. And because we can do that, we can grasp things. So if you look at a cow's hoof, they can't answer the telephone because they don't have a thumb pick the telephone up with. So monkeys, humans, we have the edge on a lot of animals by having the prehensile hands. They think that the earlier primates were lived in the trees and then slowly we came down onto the ground and became uh, hunter-gatherers. So here's something you can do with your prehensile hand, with your opposable thumb. You can use chopsticks. Another evolutionary advantage to being able to walk upright is now you have your hands free to carry your children, to hold a tool of some sort, to, to uh, your higher up, so you can spot predators more easily. So there are some advantages to walking upright. One of the disadvantages is almost everyone who's elderly has back problems. It's interesting to see how we've evolved over time. If you look, this has a very small cranial cavity 
and now you're getting a bigger cranial cavity and you have this really large mouth with big flat teeth or grinding and then you're getting yet a larger cranial cavity and larger and larger so the the further we go along here's the neanderthals and there's homo sapiens which homo is man sapiens is smart so this is wise guy so we've evolved to be wise guys it's kind of interesting to look how the jaw sticks out curves under and now it's almost straight up and down so you can go through and look at just the jaws you can look at the eye sockets where the eye sockets are located whether they have this ridge of bone up over the eye to protect it or not so it's interesting to watch the evolution of just our skulls over time things that look like human beings have been around for more than three million years but the, the bipeds that look like us homo sapiens have only been around about 200,000 years so not very long in the evolutionary scheme of things one of the things that we'll look at is some of the diseases we evolved we changed so that we have more of those certain diseases and then if you have breeding groups for example Jewish people tend to like to marry Jewish people and so if there's any uh, gene that causes something like Tay-Sachs it's going to be higher there's going to be more people who have it in that particular community because they share a common gene pool people who live in the malaria belt around the equator have a much higher incidence of sickle cell because it keeps you from dying from malaria one of my favorite cartoonists is Gary Larson he was a biology teacher and he decided to write science mostly biology cartoons and here's one of the ones that stuck with me so here's a kid asking his teacher excuse me may I be excused my brain is full so you usually you know see people raising their hand and saying my bladder's full I've got to go pee but he needs to go because his brain is already full also look at the size of his brain compared with everyone else's brain so when you study his cartoons you see more and more things that are kind of interesting I put this over here as a motivational thing Henry Ford said whether you think you can or you think you can't you are right so by thinking so you're in this course and you're looking at some of the material and you're thinking about how much material you've got to learn between now and the end of the semester and it's daunting so you can either tell yourself I can do it I'm gonna to have to set aside the time but I know I can do it or else you're thinking oh my gosh there is no way there is no way I can learn all this material there's just way too much stuff and if you think you can do it you can if you think you can't do it you won't be able to so you need to think yourself into the right frame of mind so back to our regularly scheduled topics we're going to talk about the structure of humans so Aristotle thought if you looked at the whole thing and then you drill down into the smallest parts you could understand the whole thing and so the smallest thing we have are atoms and the atoms go together to make molecules the molecules go together to make organelles organelles go together to make cells and all living things are made of cells so we know our cell theory and then you put the cells together and you get different tissues you put your tissues together you get organs you put your organs together you get organ systems 
and then you get the organism itself with all the little systems inside of it. So we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to talk about reductionistic study of anatomy versus the holistic study of anatomy and physiology. And how is this, how do doctors treat you differently, if they're, whether they are reductionist or whether they're holistic? So here's that list from atoms all the way through organelles and up through organ systems for your hierarchy of complexity. And for those who like pictures, there you go. You've got atoms, molecules, things like DNA, organelles like mitochondria, different cells, tissues, organs, organ systems. And then you have a little organism, a little baby there. So that baby is actually a large, complex system. It has so many different things. It can breathe. Its heart beats. Its brain fires. So to understand how a baby works, if you use the reductionism, then you should be able to look at its mitochondria and see how it works. Or you should be able to look at its heart tissue and see how it works. So reductionism is nice when you're looking for problems, when you're looking for diseases, and try to go down and see exactly where the problem lies. But to understand a baby, I don't know. I guess you could go down into the genes and look at the genes. But And then... Holism or holistic medicine, a lot of people make fun of holistic medicine. A lot of people think when you're talking about holistic medicine that you're talking about things like voodoo or uh, other things where you're trying to treat the whole organism with positive energy or... Uh, uh, animal sacrifices. So here's a, a little cartoon that says, we're trying a more holistic approach to our surgeries. So they're bringing in voodoo people. This cartoon is actually more realistic with what holistic is about. So here's a doctor saying, I would recommend regular exercise, healthful nutrition. So holistically treating your whole body, if you get regular exercise, that's going to help everything. It's going to help your circulation. It's going to help your muscles. It's going to reduce the amount of fat you have in your body. All these things. So you are able to change the whole body by changing certain things. Eating healthful foods. Making sure you get the right amount of protein, the right amount of carbs, um, not just eating fast food or uh, Twinkies and Ding Dongs for your meals. So, but here the doctor says, I know you won't do the holistic thing that you should do. So what I'm going to do is prescribe you a bunch of pills. So because you are fat, we're going to have to give you something for your high blood pressure. Because you have type 2 diabetes, we're going to have to give you medicine to help you control the sugar that's in your bloodstream because you won't stop eating carbs and you won't stop eating sugar. So there are pills that we can give that will counteract the destructive things you do in your body. And then there are some people like type 1 diabetics, they don't have any choice. They have to have insulin. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't take medicine, especially if your doctor thinks it will help you. But you do need to look at your lifestyle and see if there's anything you can do holistically to help your whole body. Whenever I'm teaching anatomy, I'm always saying, okay, you have this many muscles, you have this many bones, you have this much. And what we're talking about is the average person. But in actual fact, we are very different. Some people have their appendix on the right and some have it on the left. Some people have three exits from the heart coming off of the aorta, and others have less or more. 
So it varies. And if you're looking at the musculature, we have different muscles. So different people have different muscles. Of course, we know you have different sizes of muscles, depending on whether you exercise or not. But you actually, some people are missing certain muscles, and others have extra muscles that other people don't have. So we're really different. So this is kind of a cool thing. That, uh, by the way, the left and right reversal, instead of having your appendix on the one side and you have it on the other side, is called um, situs inversus, or the site is on the other side. So there you go. That That's kind of easy Latin to figure out. But look at this. Look at the different kinds of kidneys. Now, here's what you normally learn in class. Here's your kidneys. There's your adrenal glands sitting on your kidneys. Some people have one kidney up here and one way down in the pelvic region. Some people have a continuous kidney, a horseshoe-shaped kidney. Isn't that interesting? And here is the three typical branches. So when we're teaching about here's the aorta, and here's the branches off of the aorta, some people have two. This one is branches off one, and this one branches off three. Here's two, but it branches off two and two. And here's one that branches off one, two, three, four, five. Weird. So we're all a little bit different. So we talk about a general or average or what most people's anatomy looks like. But keep in mind, there's some weird stuff going out there. Now, this person is not said to have evolved because it's not like a whole population suddenly started growing their kidneys that way. Just a handful of people started doing it. Our next topic are functions of the body that pretty much everyone does. We all grew up. We started out as a little six, seven, eight pound baby, and now we are considerably larger than that. We went from being a child and not being able to walk very well and spitting up on ourselves to some of us ballerinas and athletes are very, very graceful and have good control over our bodies. We have uh, gotten old, some of us, and got wrinkled, and our hair stopped making pigment, so then we go gray. So we are able to change over our lifetime. We can grow, we can develop. So how do you know whether something is alive or not? So if you talk about viruses, because we've been talking about especially the COVID virus for ever so long, is it alive? Well, we talk about killing viruses with Lysol, so that would indicate that they were alive in order for you to kill them. But what they probably should put on their bottle is it inactivates viruses. Because by most of the criterion of what's alive and what's not alive, the virus isn't. So they don't start out as baby viruses and grow up to be mature viruses. They don't go through puberty. They don't change their characteristics along the way. Pretty much, they get into a cell. If they can find a receptor that will let them in, they take over the machinery of the cell and force it to make copies or clones of itself. And then it goes on out. Now, we know that they can mutate because we're looking right now at all the different variations of COVID that are out there. And we've got the Delta variant. And we've got the Lambda variant. And then they've named some of the variants or the mutations after the country in which they are, it is emerging. So virus can change a little bit. They can mutate a little bit. And the more it can mutate the scarier it is because the less likely we are to be immune from it. So we're watching very carefully how it mutates. 
most living things, well, all living things, have homeostasis. They have the ability to regulate their inner um, workings. So a rock pretty much can't take care of itself. It can't stop the weathering on the outside. It can't stop if it water gets into a crack and then freezes and causes the rock to break. If it goes tumbling down a hill and pieces fall off, it can't fix itself. So it can't maintain homeostasis. On the other hand, if we get overheated, we can go into an air-conditioned area and cool off or pour water on ourselves. We know all kinds of tricks to maintain homeostasis. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about homeostasis, we have whole books dedicated just to talking about what is normal, what is homeostatic about your glucose level. So we know even though you eat candy bars and pie and cookies and drink sugar-sweetened drinks, you will pull the amount of sugar in your bloodstream back down under 100 milligrams per deciliter. That's just what we do. Unless, of course, you're diabetic. And then you're going to have too much sugar in your bloodstream because you are no longer in homeostasis as far as sugar or glucose is concerned. And then your uh, the nitrogen levels that are coming out of your urine, this person has about the right amount. So you don't want to get rid of too much nitrogen and you certainly don't want a buildup of nitrogen in your body because it's toxic. In fact, almost everyone who dies, unless you're killed by a tractor trailer truck, dies from uh, too much ammonia in their body. Your kidneys start shutting down and the ammonia builds up and you die. But they're going to put down on your death certificate that you died of uh, AIDS, or you died of cancer, or you died of COVID. But usually what you really, really, really died of at the very end is too much nitrogen. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, how much sodium do you have? You need a certain amount of sodium in your body. If you don't have the right amount, look how tight that is. 135 to 145. That is a very narrow range of sodium. So think about it. you go and you eat salted peanuts, or even worse, you eat uh, pretzels that have massive amounts of salt on them. And it doesn't hurt you because your body says, okay, you got too much sodium, let's just pee it out. So it comes out in your urine instead of hurting you. So we can maintain homeostasis, and there's actually entire books that will tell you this is the homeostatic range or the normal for whatever it is that you, you're talking about. So if you go into a doctor's office, they're going to have one of these things and they can look it up. Of course, nowadays when they report your test results, they usually tell you, uh-oh, your bilirubin is too high. So this one's actually rather high. It's 1.8 and you should be between 0 and 1.2. So this is a breakdown product of red blood cells. So something's going on that's causing them to break down their red blood cells incorrectly. And so this is coming out in the urine or the blood. Excuse me, this is a, this is a metabolic panel. So we're looking at it coming out in the blood. Eventually, of course, it's going to be coming out in the urine too. So you can look up, if you've got the time, and see... What is normal for calcium? What is normal for the amount of protein that you have in your um, plasma? So it's, it's kind of interesting. And every time I go to the doctor and they draw blood, I insist that I get a copy of my records so that I can see how I'm doing with maintaining homeostasis. So another characteristic of a living thing is that they are much more complex. They have a higher level of organization than non-living things. So if you look at a rock, some of the rocks are just rocks. and But some of them are actually kind of 
complex. You break open a geode, and inside it's got crystals. Um, if you go into sedimentary river rock, you find all kinds of rocks that are compressed together and held together. But still, they're not nearly as complicated as we are with our DNA, with our organelles, all the things going on in our body. Living matter is always compartmentalized into one or more cells, so there's our cell theory coming back. We have the ability to metabolize. Now, like the virus, it had to take over the cell and make the cell do its metabolism for it because it doesn't have that capability. But we have the ability to eat candy bars, go get a Big Mac, whatever it is that you eat, and break it down and use the parts to rebuild our body to grow. Sometimes you just grow fat, but sometimes you grow taller. So we have the ability to break down or do chemical reactions. And we respond. So if somebody hits us, we cry, or we hit them back, or we run. But we have some sort of a response for every action. If somebody is too loud, their music is too loud, or they're whistling, or uh, using a jackhammer, you respond by trying to protect your ears. So we have the ability to respond to stimulus. And we have the ability to move. So when you think about a tree, you're like, well, that tree has been there for 100 years, and it's not moved. But the leaves move. Buds grow on the end. So there is some movement going on. It's just not as fast as somebody running down the football field with a, with a football tucked under their arm. Continuing on with characteristics of life, we already talked about homeostasis. You try to maintain a normal value for everything in your body. Normal pH, normal proteins, normal hormones, all of that stuff. We can differentiate and grow. We started out as one fertilized egg, a sperm and an egg. That's all we were. And then we divided and we were two cells. And then we divided and we were four cells. And somewhere along the way, some of the cells decided, wait a minute, I'm going to go off and be some bone. And some of the cells decided they were going to go off and be muscle. Others decided they were going to go off and be skin. So somewhere along the way, you differentiate or you became different. So you started growing different body parts and you continue to grow. We also have the ability to make copies of ourselves. So we actually have learned how to clone so we can make an exact copy of you. Literally, an exact copy with the exact same DNA. But normally we do it the old-fashioned way where a guy donates the sperm, the girl donates the egg, and then you get an organism that's a little bit like dad and a little bit like mom. So we're constantly changing our genes around. And then eventually we evolve. So certain combinations of genes don't work, and those people die out. They don't have babies. So those genes die out. And the ones that are considered better or allow you to adapt to your environment, those persist. And so, as you saw from the skulls, over time, we have evolved. We have changed. One of the things that we need to keep in mind is when we're doing the whole homeostasis thing is we need to see what is it that it would take to maintain homeostasis in a man versus in a woman? Someone who is 200 pounds, somebody who is 100 pounds. Somebody that has not gone through puberty yet versus somebody who's already gone through puberty. All these things are going to be different. 
and it says failure to consider variation can lead to overmedication of the elderly or medicating women on the basis of research done on men. And that's so important to pay attention to that. So some medications act differently in a woman because we have different hormones. Our body's different as opposed to a man. So keep that in mind. When we get into the endocrine system, we're going to talk about negative feedback and positive feedback, but they touch down a little bit on it in this chapter and want us to just mention it. So let's say that you have too much sugar in your bloodstream so your sugar is rising your sugar is rising your sugar is rising and it's not healthy you're you're going to have uh, bacterial overgrowth you're going to put a strain on your kidneys all kinds of problems uh, people who don't take care of their sugar a lot of times they end up losing their legs they go blind so you grow new blood vessels in your eyeballs because you don't take care of your sugar so it's important that we have a negative feedback. It's like, okay, that's too much sugar. We need to shut off whatever it is that's putting the sugar into the bloodstream. So everybody knows about insulin, which takes sugar out of the bloodstream, but a lot of people don't know anything about uh, glucagon, which puts the sugar back into the bloodstream. So you have hormones that work point counterpoint. One works, and then you shut it off, and you turn the other one on. So you can regulate. So you have some hormones that regulate putting water into your bloodstream, and you have others that take it out by making you pee it out. So we call those diuretics. And then the antidiuretic hormone is the one that keeps you from peeing it out. So if you don't have enough blood pressure, then you're going to be releasing that and putting the water back into your bloodstream so that you don't have your bloodstream collapse, go into um, hypovolemic shock from not having enough fluid. So we do negative feedback by either shutting off whatever hormone is working or turning on the opposing hormone. So there's a variety of ways that we can do negative feedback. But the end result is you get the, all the sugar that you need out of the bloodstream. Or if you don't have enough sugar, you put enough in so that you're always right around 100. So you want to be 100 or below. If you're too hot, you're going to have the blood vessels under your skin dilate and you can start sweating. If you're too cold, the vessels constrict and that holds the heat in the core of your body internally. So your arms and fingers and toes are going to get really cold and you actually might get frostbite. But the, you, you survive because you maintained an internal body temperature. You warmed your core. So Again, positive and negative loops. I think that we all know what you do with a the thermostat if you're too hot or you're too cold. So here they're saying the same thing with pictures. They're saying it with graphs. But if you're too hot, you dilate your blood vessels, your face turns red. So you probably you've seen people out or they're working in their garden or their whatever and they get overheated and they turn beet red and you go, man, you need to sit down and cool off because you're going to have a stroke. You're way too hot. Or the person who has really blue lips because they're so cold and they're shivering. So vasoconstriction and shivering trying to keep yourself warm. Most of you listening to this are going to be youngsters and you won't even know what the heck we're talking about here. But old people or skinny people, when they stand up out of bed, a lot of times they fall down. 
All the blood when you stand up, all the blood rushes down out of your head and you can actually black out for just a second or and not long enough for you to fall down, hopefully back into your bed. So you have a homeostatic imbalance from the blood leaving the head and the heart has little receptors that says, whoa, wait a minute, we don't have enough pressure. This person must have uh, stood up too fast. And so it will push your blood pressure up. So you youngsters, you do it so well, you don't usually fall down. You don't stand up suddenly out of a chair and then fall over. Like, But you see old people, and they do it all the time. So we don't have the same homeostatic ability as you youngsters do. There are a few positive feedback. So instead of saying, okay, raise it up, lower it down, raise it up, lower it down, it just goes, make it go higher, make it go higher, make it go higher. And the classic example that they use in almost every single textbook is childbirth. So you start out having contractions, and the contractions get stronger, and they get stronger, and it's under the control of a hormone that gets more concentrated, more concentrated. You're putting more and more of it in your body, which causes you to have more contractions, which causes you to make more hormone, which causes you to make even stronger contractions, which makes more hormone. And then you finally make enough hormone that the baby just pops right on out. At that point in time, you don't have anything, you don't have a baby anymore. The baby's not sending signals anymore, and all of a sudden, the hormones will crash. You don't need them anymore. You don't need to keep pushing. You don't need to keep having contractions because the baby's already out. So that's, that's a pleasant, that's a happy, positive feedback cycle. But some of the negative feedback cycles are uh, like a fever so you get hotter, which causes more chemicals to be released, which causes your fever to go higher, which causes more chemicals to be released. And then you, so they call it a runaway fever. So a vicious circle or cycle of runaway fever. One of the last Topics they're going to be talking about in this chapter are gradients. So, things tend to go from high concentration to low concentration. If you have a bathtub full of water and the side cracks in the side of your bathtub, the water is going to flow out because there's more water in the bathtub than there is outside the bathtub. So the water is going to tend to run out of the bathtub. You would be very surprised if you cracked your bathtub and the water started flowing into the bathtub because it's already full of water. So it wouldn't make any sense. So common sense tells us about gradients. It talks about it. You know, it's just common sense stuff. Um, one of the examples I always use is you put on perfume, and the perfume is very concentrated. I just sprayed it on my neck, behind my ear. It's very concentrated. As it evaporates, it flows away from me and becomes more dilute, more dilute. So anybody who's really close to me is going to smell it and say, oh, I really like that perfume, or whoa, you have way too much perfume on, and you're actually making my eyes water because you have too much. But people who are maybe 20 feet away, they don't smell it at all. So you have this gradient from high concentration on your neck to low concentration from somebody who's sitting, you know, 10 feet away. Now, the tendency is for the 
high concentration to flow to the wards, the negative or the low concentration. So eventually, if you're sitting in a room, the amount of perfume that's on you will be the same as the amount of perfume that's over by the door, will be the same as the amount of perfume over by the window. So it will equilibrate. Just like the homeostasis thing where you try to get to a normal. In the case of a gradient, it will try and spread itself out uniformly. Another example that you guys have probably seen, you get a pitcher of water and you put some colored substance in it like tea or you put um, Kool-Aid in there. And right where you put it in, it is much more concentrated. So you have just pure water, which doesn't have any Kool-Aid in it, doesn't have any tea in it. And then you put the tea or the Kool-Aid in, and now it's going to distribute itself. And you can actually watch it. So it's going to be very concentrated when it comes in, but it'll start swirling. And you can actually see the little eddy currents as it swirls around. And if you leave it alone and you come back an hour or two later, it's going to be uniformly the same color unless it has particulate in it, and then the particulate will fall. Like if you do grapefruit juice, you're going to get particulate laying in the bottom. You're going to get sediment in the bottom. But if, it's, if it is uh, fairly uniform in density and size, then it will uniformly disperse out. So I've been talking and talking, and basically all I said was anything that's at a high concentration will tend to go to a lower concentration until you have the same concentration everywhere. So hopefully I sum that up for you. So in your body, you have some things. For example, when your nerves fire or when your um, muscles fire and you have a gradient where you have a concentration of ions, they rush across the membrane, they depolarize, and we'll learn all these terms when we get into muscles and nerves, and now your muscle fires or your nerve fires. And now it can't do anything for a little while because what you did is you equalized the charged particles, the ions. So now you've got to recharge your muscle or recharge your nerve so you got to pull those ions back in so we this is one of the things now this is going to take energy to do that because what you're doing is you're going against a gradient anytime you go against a gradient so let's think about you getting in your little boat and you're going downstream that doesn't take energy to go downstream the stream will pull your boat down with it but if you say, well, no, wait a minute, I want to go back the other way, you're going to be bucking the direction. So you're actually going to have to use a lot of energy to row yourself or to use a gas motor or whatever to go upstream against the current. So your body has to do that from time to time. It needs a concentration, and so it will have to use a lot of energy. So... We have a chapter, I think it's the next chapter we do, where we talk about ATP energy and how we harness it and we use it to build the gradient back up again. Now, this may sound weird to you, but let's, let's look at something you're very familiar with. Let's take your iPhone or your Android, whatever it is that you walk around with, and it's got a lot of ions, it's charged up, and you can use it. But you actually have a little gauge on there that shows that the ions are slowly trickling out. Slowly trickling out. And now your phone is only 60% charged. Now it's only 30% charged. And now it's 0% charged. And you have no charge. So what you're going to have to do is find an energy source. And we don't use ATP energy, although we could. We could harness the ATP energy and charge our phones with that. But we just walk over to the nearest plug-in in the wall, 
and we use our little adapter cord and we plug it in and you know if you're lucky 10 15 20 minutes later you're charged back up again you're ready to go so we work with gradients and we don't even really think about it but that's an energy gradient and your phone goes dead and you recharge it so you build up the energy gradient again and it slowly trickles down while making your phone work so if you can remember the phone analogy and remember your phone going dead and then recharging it, then you kind of get the idea of what's going on with nerves and muscles because that's what they do too. They kind of depolarize, they go dead, and then they have to pump themselves back up again and get a gradient so it's ready to fire again. So that's what they're talking about. Chemicals flow down, concentration gradients, charge particles flow down, electrical gradient, heat flows down, thermal gradients. So we have all kinds of gradients in our body. But ultimately, we either empty out completely or we achieve homeostasis. So those are your choices. Here's a couple of interesting examples that your book gives. Obviously, going down the hill doesn't use energy, but pulling it back up is going to use up energy. So there's one analogy that you can think of. Another one, when we do blood pressure, we actually go out to your uh, arm and look at the blood pressure out there. But imagine what it would be like if we measured the blood pressure as the blood is actually leaving the heart right here through the aorta you're going to have unbelievably high pressure compared to what you have by the time it reaches your arm so we talk about gradients and we measure like blood pressure with a high number and a low number so we're looking at a gradient of pressure there so we talk so much about gradients then we're going to talk about osmosis. We're going to talk about filtration in the kidneys. So what stays in the body and what filters out and, and exits the body in urine. So we're going to have, we're just going to talk about gradients so much. So I think that's interesting because I've never seen a textbook that talks about gradients in chapter one. It usually is just a, like a preview of things to come. And we're going to talk about childbirth, and we're going to talk about sex ed, we're going to talk about muscles, we're going to talk about your skin. But this one is like, you need to understand gradients because you're going to be using it in every chapter. You need to understand that we are a com 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 excuse me, <laughs> combination of cells. And those cells and how they combine and how many we have of different kinds determines how our bodies function. So we're going to learn about that sort of thing too. One of the things that they suggest, and I suggest this to you too, unless you were one of the very few lucky people who actually took Latin in high school or you're taking Latin in college, there's about 1,200 Latin terms. And if you knew those, you'd pretty much understand everything because all the things that we're going to be talking about in anatomy are going to be pretty much Greek or Latin terms. So, for example, today I was in class and we were talking about the hypodermis. That's the layer underneath your dermis which is the layer underneath your epidermis. So you have epidermis, dermis, and then below that's the hypodermis. And the hypodermic region is where you put hypodermic needles and inject people if you're giving shots with a hypodermic syringe. So if you know the word hypo, it means below or low. If you know epi, EPI, then you know that that is upon. It is the epidermis is upon the dermis. It's on top of. So learning the prefixes and learning the endings. If you see ASE, ACE on something, you're talking about an enzyme. 
So sucrase uh, would be an enzyme breaks down sucrose. So there's then you just add ace on the end of a word and it tells you what it's breaking down. If you add os, then you're talking about a sugar. Glucose, dextrose, fructose, maltose, galactose, lactose. So os is a sugar. Oma, OMA means tumor. So you have melanoma, adenoma, sarcomas. So oma is, is the ending that denotes a cancer. So if you have time between listening to my lectures and going to lab and studying, studying, and then having a life, spend some time. In the back of the book, there's a, an appendix that has the most common of the prefixes and the common of the suffixes and then the roots. And putting them together, you'd be surprised at how much easier anatomy becomes. One of the things that this textbook tries to do, and as they say in, in my part of the world, I ain't for it, or I ain't for it, is we have a lot of common names for example, the fallopian tube, the vas deferens, the eustachian tube. And this textbook is going through and it's trying to rename everything by either what organ it is attached to or um, some Latin term. So a lot of the stuff in your body is named after the person who discovered it. And I see the author's point. He's like, telling you the fallopian tube doesn't tell you anything about where it is or what it does. But if you use a word like the oviduct, then you're like, oh, that's where the egg goes through. So it tells you more about it. So I understand why he's joining the um, march forward to change and take away people's names and call it by what it's doing. But it's so confusing. So when you're going through this textbook, you're going to have the old term, what everybody and people my age call things, and then the new proposed terms that they're trying to switch over to. So the eustachian tube is the one that gets clogged up and kids have to have tubes in their ears. So I don't know if you know any kids who have to have tubes in their ears, but otherwise your eardrum pops because you build up so much pressure in your eustachian tube. And now they're trying to call it the auditory tube. So you're reading along, you go, well, I wonder where the auditory, well, it has to do something with the ear. And then you realize, oh, they talk about the eustachian tube. So it's a little bit confusing for older people. Another thing while you're busy learning all those prefixes and suffixes and root words, you also need to learn how to pluralize, how to make something plural that's singular. So we know that in most things you just add an S, and now it's plural. But when you're doing Latin stuff, you may add an A or an E onto the end of it, or you may change the U.S. to an I, like caucus is a round shaped bacteria and COCCI are a bunch of them. So streptococcus are bacteria that are round and that are in strings, streptococcus. Staphylococcus are round bacteria that are in grape formations. They look like a bunch of grapes the way they're hanging together. So this is nice when you're trying to identify which kind of bacteria that you're playing around with. You look at the size of it, the shape of it, whether it's circular, corkscrew, whether it clumps or it hangs out in strings. So there's all these things. If you take med micro, you're going to be learning all that stuff. But one of the hardest things for people to do is knowing the singular and the plural of Greek and Latin words. So you'll spend a little time learning those. Why is it important for spelling? Well, my one of my favorite stories is my daughter's teacher 
sent home a note and said that the next morning in class, all the kids were going to have a testis. Well, he thought the plural of test, T-E-S-T, -E was T-E-S-T-E-S. -E -E well, that happens to be a testicle or a, the what we would call the ball that is in your scrotal sac. So, obviously, they were not passing out testicles to the students the next day. So, spelling is important. One of the classic things that people misspell is prostrate and prostate. So, the prostate gland is a gland that encircles your urethra, and it can help or hinder you when you're trying to pee. But, and only guys have it, girls don't have a prostate. But prostrate means you have fallen down, you are laying flat, you are prostrate. So it is important that you spell prostate and prostrate correctly. So you know whether you've fallen down or you're talking about the gland that encircles the urethra. Um, let's see. Inside the nucleus of a cell, we're going to talk about the nucleus, and we're going to talk about the nucleolus. So they sound awfully close, nucleus, nucleolus, but one of them is the whole thing that contains the DNA, all your chromosomes, everything like that, and the nucleolus is a wad of RNA that makes ribosomes. So two different things, but they're spelled very, very closely. So one of the things I do when I'm taking notes, I try to write down words that kids get confused. Cellulose versus cellulite. Cellulose is the stuff that makes trees hard. It's the stuff where you put the sugars together and you make the bark. So the hard part of a tree. Or, or a branch or grass or whatever. But cellulite is where the tissue, the epidermis and dermis and the hypodermis are stretched so far that now the fat that underlies it pushes up through the skin and you, it looks kind of like you've got cottage cheese up in under your skin. And I'm sure you've stood behind somebody while you're waiting to check out and they're wearing short shorts and they look like they have cottage cheese up in underneath their skin. It's not very attractive. But that's cellulite, not cellulose. So that's just some examples. So spelling does count. And if you're going into a medical field, you need to practice spelling words correctly because that would be horrible if you wrote down something on a patient's chart that was a misspelling that caused them to get the wrong treatment. So about 90% of all the words that you're going to be learning in class, I said, are going to be Greek or Latin. And any structure, any die, anything like that that's named after a person, they call them eponyms or ponyms, and they're trying to do away with that. They're just trying to take everybody's name out because it doesn't help you know something about the structure or something about the function. So they're trying to get rid of all of those. They've apparently been trying since 1895, and in 1998 they came out with even more uh, changes. So I'm sure that they're not done yet. It's funny, when you guys get older... You're going to be just like me. You're going to be saying, well, back in my day, we called it this. I don't know why they had to go and change a perfectly good name to something else, and now nobody even knows what you're talking about anymore. Another thing that you've got besides the, the um, Latin is you have acronyms. You have where you just take the first letter. So you have CAT scans. You have pet scans, and they just take the first letter. Lasers, 
that's a that's another acronym so that's where you just take the first letter and you make a word out of just the first letter so you're going to see some of that too Here's a slide showing you some of the plural forms. So the cortex is the outer covering or the cork layer of something. So you have a, usually a cortex and then a medulla, which is the middle part. And if you wanted to say that in the plural form, it's cortices. So you go from cortex, you take the X off and change, or the EX off and change it to cortices. Corpus is singular. Corpora is plural. So now I've been talking about two hours of about chapter one, and we can boil it down into anatomy and physiology, our form and function. And it's almost impossible to teach just anatomy without explaining what's going on. And it's almost impossible to teach physiology unless you know the names of the different uh, organs, systems, tissues, what have you. Because you don't even know what they're talking about. So you really need to teach the two together. So I've seen a few colleges that just teach anatomy and I think, I would not want to teach there. Cells make up every living thing. We evolve. Those things that are alive evolve. We are more and more complex, much more complex than things like rocks. We can maintain homeostasis until we get really old and then it kind of flies apart. And most of the stuff that happens in our body happens because of gradients our thinking, our muscles moving, digestion, all of those things have to do with gradients and the fact that things go from high concentration to low concentration. So a few of the last things to talk about. X-rays look at mostly calcium, things that block the flow of energy at the flow of x-rays that are that absorb them so it doesn't go through onto the photographic plate here is kind of a cool picture i always like to show this show this one and it i tells you why you should not wear high heels look what that does to the toes that is not natural to do that it's also interesting to see the arch. It's interesting to see how they make the shoes. So that's holding the spike of the shoe right there. It's interesting to see how much flesh there is and then how much is bone. So this is just a cool picture. I really like it. Let's see if I can pull it back up a little bit. Most of the medical imaging that's done is x-rays because you can just you can see all kinds of stuff with x-rays and some of the stuff you can't see very well with x-rays you can inject some sort of a dye and then you're able to go ahead and use the x-rays because you put something that is radio opaque in there. See there's that word radio opaque something that the energy of the x-rays can't get through. So you can inject it, you can swallow it, you can put it in the anus uh, like a barium enema. You can look at blood vessels, you can follow the intestinal tract and see if it, you've got blockage in there. So there's all sorts of things going on. Here is a picture where you can see that this is open, no problems, no problems. And you look and see if there's a place where you have a narrowing where the blood can't get through. So this is a cerebral angiogram where they've got the contrast dye. 
and you can look at it. So even with the acronyms, they are changing the acronyms too. So back in my day, they called them CAT scans, and now they've taken the A out and they just call them CT scans, computed tomography scans. These are where you take images, you take a slice, you take another slice, you take another slice. You're not actually slicing, but the machine is taking a picture, a slice at a time, and then it assembles it to give you a, a picture, a 3D picture of something. So this is better than x-rays. A CAT scan will definitely give you a better picture and give you more information than just an x-ray. But you're being exposed to more x-rays than you would just getting an x-ray. And then we have MRI, which is magnetic resonance imaging. And if you've ever been around it, it sounds like they put you in an oil drum or metal drum and they sit and bang on it with hammers what it sounds like. There's just pounding and it literally gets your uh, atoms to vibrating and they've got machines that can actually look at the movement and as it looks at the movement it's mapping the soft tissues. It can map your brain, it can map your blood vessels. So it's more expensive to get a, a an MRI but it is a lot better quality than a CT scan. So an x-ray is fairly cheap, CT scans a little more expensive, MRI is usually up in the thousands of dollars to get one of those. And it also takes a while. Sometimes it can take half an hour, sometimes over an hour. But the coolest thing is, the latest thing is functional MRIs. In 60 minutes did a segment on it and it is amazing because they can actually watch your brain as you think about things. And they can tell you, when you say the word hammer, they know what part of your brain lit up. So if you're in the MRI, <coughs> excuse me, the MRI machine and somebody says the word hammer, they know it because that part of the brain lit up. So apparently it lights up in that position in almost everybody. So literally, they can read your mind. Whatever you're thinking of will light up parts of your brain, and they can look at that and say, oh, you're thinking about ice cream. Oh, you're thinking about a screwdriver. I put the link in here. You can either type in just fMRI and then stall. It was Leslie Stahl in 60 Minutes who did the segment. That's how I pulled it up. Or if you want, you can just type in www.youtube.com, watch, and then this right there. And you'll be able to pull up a fascinating, uh, scary thing. So if they're able to read our minds, and they're actually using it. They're using it to see whether you get excited when you see coach purses or uh, Vidasa soon or whatever name brand see what excites you so they, they can actually already do that so they can gear what they want to sell you but anyway if you have the time watch that it's it's fascinating another thing you can do in medical imaging is you can make sonograms you just use sound waves and bounce it off of whatever is in there. So the most common one that they do, or one of the common ones that they do, is looking at babies before they're born. And while it's not very sharp image, usually it's enough to where you can tell whether it's a boy or a girl. You can look and see. And you can look and see if there's something badly wrong with the baby, if it's not forming correctly. You, you don't have x-rays in this. You're using sound waves. And I don't know if you've ever watched somebody. They put a kind of a gel on, and then they have this thing that emits sound waves, and then you can actually see the baby. And they've gotten much better. They have 3D uh, sonograms, and you can see quite a bit of detail here. 
So they've, they've come a long way. Another kind of medical imaging that they do is the PET scan or positron emission tomography scan. And this one actually looks at which tissues are doing metabolism, which ones are building up or breaking down stuff. So the common currency that we use in most of the tissues of our body is glucose. The brain really has to have glucose. And if you make the glucose radioactive and you put somebody in the machine that can look for radioactivity, it will actually light up your brain in the areas where the glucose or the radioactive glucose is being summoned and being used. So this is what a PET scan looks like. So here they're really using a lot of glucose. And here they're not using hardly any at all, the darker areas. So you have to be trained on knowing, is this okay? Is this too much darkness? Is this darkness caused because the tissues died? Or is it caused because the person's not thinking and using that part of the brain? This is a picture of an MRI picture of the brain. And you can look at the detail. And it does it again, slice by slice, and then they assemble it so you can look and see what's going on. Now, look at this one compared with the PET scan, compared with the CAT scan or CT scan. See how little definition you get? I mean, you can see the eyes, and you can tell the brain. But when you compare that one with this one, you can see the blood vessels, optic chiasm, you can see all that stuff. You can see the little bones inside the nose. Here you have an x-ray of the bones right there. And the last thing I wanted to tell you about is at the back of your chapter, it's got the body regions. It's got sagittal cuts versus coronal frontal uh, versus transverse cross-section. It talks about the quadrants of the body, the hypochondriac region. Uh, the epigastric, the hypogastric regions, all of this stuff. It's, it's an enormous amount of anatomy to memorize. So what I do mostly in lecture is I tell you the physiology, and we kind of expect you to memorize the anatomy in lab. So one of the things, I'm not your lab instructor, but if you look on my YouTube site, I have the labs where I talk about all of these things. So you can look at lab one and it'll tell you a lot of the stuff that's at the end of your chapter. But I'm going to stop here with just a couple of slides. If you can come up with something that's funny or something that sticks in your mind. So the name of the kneecap is the patella. So this is your patellar region. And I thought this was funny because this is above the knee and this is below knee. So anyway, I thought that was funny. Kind of have to think about it for a while. And a lot of the students go, why in the world do we have to learn the Latin? Why don't we just use the name? Well, you need to be specific. And here's an example that I thought was funny. Your buccal region is your cheek region. But your cheek, a lot of people think of the hips as the cheeks. And that's the gluteal region. So you have different cheeks depending on what you're talking about. But nobody will get the buccal and the gluteal region mixed up. And I'm going to end with Homer Simpson. 
showing you his intergluteal cliff. This is the end.